Sudah terbisa terlihat uh, screen saya? Udah. Oke, okay, good. Oke, okay, selamat sore Bapak Ibu sekalian. Good afternoon everyone. Salam sejahtera. My name is Jessica Hanafi. I hope you and your family are well in good health ya. Yeah. Uh, Mudah-mudahan dengan keadaan COVID ini kita tetap bisa produktif. Uh, thank you all for joining uh, with us today in this uh, webinar session of EPD Southeast Asia, the regional hub of the international EPD system for Southeast Asia region. This webinar is organized in collaboration between EPD of Southeast Asia and Indonesia Cleaner Production Center or Pusat Produksi Bersih Nasional PPBN. I will be moderating this webinar today and uh, we already addressed some of the housekeeping rule before yeah uh, and our we would I would like to introduce first the EPD Southeast Asia maybe some of you uh, haven't heard about us uh, belum kenal nah katanya belum kenal maka tak sayang jadi uh, saya perkenalkan dulu Uh, the Southeast Asia EPD program is a platform for environmental information operating in alignment with our partners, the international EPD system. The EPD Southeast Asia was launched last April, initiated in response to the growing environmental awareness in the region. Yeah? Uh, while life cycle assessment is still at the very early stage in this region, not only in Indonesia, and we feel that it is very important for us to be able to contribute and be part of the initial stakeholders of LCA ecosystem. And to provide credible and comparable LCA studies that can be accepted worldwide. As a start, we operate in these uh, five countries, Indonesia, Malaysia, Singapore, uh, 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 Philippines, and Vietnam. Uh, and we are looking forward to partner up with various individuals, associations, companies, academia, and government organizations that have the same vision to build a robust and credible environmental information and to provide assurance and also confidence to any users of these documents anywhere around the world. We are the program operator for the Type 3 Environmental Declaration in accordance with the ISO 14025. And we also adopt the European standard EN 15804 for construction products and materials. Yeah? All of them to communicate, communicate credible environmental information. Indonesia Cleaner Production Center or Pusat Produksi Bersih Nasional is our partner for this webinar. It's a non-profit organization established for promoting, uh, implementing, development, and providing resource efficiency and cleaner production, and also serve as a resource pool for RCT experts, including all the activities. ICPC has been uh, serving several projects related to cleaner production and Envision to be the primary reference and leading role organization that encourages development, application, and promotion of uh, RECP concept, methodology, tools, and also uh, promoting technologies towards sustainable consumption and production. Uh, ICPC do projects with UNIDO, GIZ, and collaborate with various organizations in Indonesia promoting sustainability. Our agenda for today, We will begin with an opening remarks from Sekretaris Proper, Direktorat Jenderal Pengendalian Pencemaran dan Kerusakan Lingkungan, Pak Sigit uh, Reliantoro. And then uh, we, uh, our speaker for today is Sebastian Stiller from um, EPD International. He is the Business Director of uh, in uh, at EPD International. Originally, Dr. Gustav Sandin uh, will present uh, this webinar. However, uh, Gustav just welcome a new baby, so he is on paternity leave now. Um, and uh, David Adiwijaya, Pak David Adiwijaya from EPD Southeast Asia will also present on how to use PCR in Indonesian setting. We will later have a question and answer session at the end, and you can write down your question in, uh, in the Q&A feature in Zoom. And then, uh, without further ado, I welcome Pak Sigit to give the opening remark. The floor is yours, Pak. Silakan mau pakai bahasa Indonesia juga. Uh, Oke. Okay. Terima kasih, Bu Jessica. Uh, selamat sore, Bapak Ibu sekalian. Uh, Halo, Pak. 
Halo Pak, Pak Sigit. Halo, Pak. Koneksinya turun. Halo Pak, kedengeran nggak Pak Sigit? Pak Sigit? Um, mohon ah, maaf. Ya, Pak. Ya. Mohon maaf, internetnya ternyata <laughs> dari. Ya. Yeah. Bapak silakan um, Pak. Boleh. Uh, saya akan berbicara lebih banyak mengenai uh, konteksnya proper, karena nanti yang berkaitan dengan uh, produk uh, rule declaration lebih banyak di Bu Jessica dan Pak Sebastian dan Pak David yang menjelaskan. Tapi ada beberapa hal yang yang pokok yang barangkali bagaimana mengembangkan uh, produk declaration rule ini di konteksnya di Indonesia. Pertama adalah, uh, lanjut, ada beberapa hal kenapa uh, proper itu menggunakan uh, LCA sebagai bagian dari uh, kriterianya. Uh, saya lupa buku apa ini, tapi buku ini sangat mempengaruhi kami dalam mengembangkan kriteria proper. Pertama adalah kalau kita belajar, itu sebetulnya adalah kayak mengumpulkan titik. Jadi kita hanya bisa tahu ini, oh itu titik, titik, titik. Itu tidak akan berarti kalau kita tidak mengkonekkan titik-titik itu. Menjadi pengalaman, menjadi pembelajaran, dan lain sebagainya. Tapi mengkonekkan titik itu hanya berhenti di pengetahuan yang ada di kita. Tapi bagaimana titik itu bisa menjadi, kalau di gambar ini menjadi anjing, bisa menjadi kucing, bisa menjadi bentuk apa, yang artinya adalah bisa diimplementasikan di lapangan, menjadi inovasi yang tidak sekedar uh, ide, maka perlu ada langkah tindak lanjut yang barangkali itu bisa digambarkan di slide berikutnya. Lanjut. Nah, Tadi kalau titik-titik itu hanya berupa pengetahuan. Kalau kita sudah bisa mulai mengkonekkan, mulai mengartikan hubungan antara satu pengetahuan dengan pengetahuan lain, maka kita sudah sampai kepada menjadi juristik, menjadi orang yang pintar, menjadi orang yang berpengalaman. Tapi untuk mengimplementasikan dalam kehidupan sehari-hari, garis-garis hubungan itu harus sudah menjadi algoritma. Kalau di otak kita itu, kalau di cara kerja itu menjadi SOP. Kalau SOP itu kita ulang-ulang menjadi ritme, menjadi kebiasaan, sehingga kalau menjadi habit untuk bertindak ABCD yang lebih jelas. Nah, kami di proper menggunakan tool-tool itu sebetulnya untuk mengampung semua nulis tadi tidak menjadi haki Bapak Ibu sekalian dalam mengelola lingkungan. Sehingga banyak sekali tool yang kita integrasikan di dalam kriteria proper, sebetulnya tujuannya adalah membuat itu menjadi habit bagi Bapak Ibu sekalian untuk mengelola lingkungan dengan menjadi lebih baik. Salah satunya adalah LCA yang dulu kita punya sistem manajemen lingkungan, kita audit energi, sudah kita implementasikan sebetulnya itu bagian dari kita membentuk algoritma di dalam cara berpikir kita sehingga kita tahu apa yang kita kerjakan, kita bisa belajar dari sistem yang kita bangun tersebut. Boleh lanjut. Nah, sehingga ada satu perubahan kriteria yang dulu kita berfokus kepada uh, sistem manajemen lingkungan, efisiensi energi, dan lain sebagainya, uh, akan berubah menjadi kriteria yang baru. Kita uh, akhir bulan ini sudah akan menyampaikan uh, rancangan permen untuk per, uh, revisi kriteria proper uh, nomor 13 tahun 2014. Jadi akan ada kriteria baru. Basisnya masih sama, ketaatan terhadap lingkungan masih menjadi bagian dari dasar dari proper, tetapi sistem manajemen lingkungan, karena kita sudah cukup confidence dengan data-data, sudah cukup bisa dipahami dan menjadi algoritma 
bagi teman-teman di industri karena nilainya sekarang rata-rata 90 sampai 97 bahkan sudah ada yang 100 dalam implementasi penerapan sistem manajemen lingkungan. Jadi itu kita turunkan menjadi screening untuk menjadi hijau. Jadi kalau nilainya kurang dari 60 dia tidak bisa menjadi kandidat hijau. Nah, ada tool lagi yang kita pengen menjadi bagian salah satunya adalah life cycle assessment. Itu menjadi kalau kita pelajari terutama kita pengen dengan life cycle assessment itu perbaikan atau hal-hal yang baik yang sudah dilakukan dengan kriteria per yang ada sekarang yang fokusnya gate to gate di dalam industri itu sudah mulai memperluas mulai dari kredo sampai grifnya. Sehingga upaya perbaikan pengelolaan lingkungan kita, upaya untuk mengurangi intensitas dampak, itu sudah mulai dipikirkan dari sejak awal sampai nanti akan membuang ke lingkungan. Tapi tentu saja yang gate to gate-nya itu masih sangat penting bagi teman-teman untuk bisa memperbaiki setelah ketahuan hotspot-nya, efisiensi energi apa saja sih yang perlu diperbaiki di situ. Penurunan emisi apa saja sih yang perlu dilakukan di situ. Sampai air, limbah, dan bahkan juga di keanekaragaman hayati dan pemberdayaan masyarakat. Saya cerita salah satu yang mungkin sudah teman-teman banyak yang bosen dengerin cerita saya mengenai LCE yang dilakukan oleh teman-teman Pupuk Kaltim. Teman-teman di Pupuk Kaltim itu mengidentifikasi cradle, cradle to grave mulai dari ekstraksi gasnya sampai menjadi produk pupuk yang di petani. Ternyata dampak terbesarnya itu justru terjadi di konsumennya, di petaninya. Eh, eh, toksisitas terestrial, kemudian juga eh, pemakaian pupuk yang berlebihan, ternyata itu dampaknya lebih besar dibanding proses produksinya. Artinya apa? Untuk menjawab yang dulu saya lihat Pak Ibrahim juga ada di sini, Pak Ibrahim, yang dulu Pak Ibrahim menyampaikan apa sih sebetulnya yang satu sektor itu matters, yang sebetulnya itu esensial dijawab dalam pengelolaan lingkungannya, sehingga kontribusinya itu memang benar-benar dirasakan dan matters. Gitu. Nah, kalau dilihat dari LCA ini akan kelihatan yang saya cerita yang di teman-teman Pupuk Katin tadi. Mereka akan matters kalau menjawab isu bagaimana petani ini tidak menyebab menggunakan pupuk yang berlebihan, tidak menggunakan praktek-praktek yang menyebabkan eutrofikasi, menyebabkan toksisitas terhadap tanah. Maka program Komdev-nya juga harus disusun seperti itu. Dididik bagaimana petani menggunakan apa, pupuk yang baik, bahkan di teman-teman PKT itu ada satu peluang usaha baru yang diciptakan dari mempelajari LCA itu. Mereka menciptakan produk khusus yang ada unsur organiknya, ada unsur khusus yang menjadi efisien misalnya untuk reklamasi tambang. Untuk tanah yang tipikalnya tanah untuk pasir. Mereka menciptakan produk khusus itu sehingga sebetulnya hotspotnya mereka semakin lama semakin terkurangi. Nah itulah salah satu alasan kami menggunakan life cycle assessment ini untuk uh, digunakan sebagai algoritma pengelolaan lingkungan yang excellent di industri dalam proper. Nah salah satu eksesnya lagi dari life cycle assessment tentu teman-teman yang dulu tidak berkesempatan memperoleh nilai bagus di proper karena dari segi efisiensi energi mereka kalah dengan yang pemakaian energinya besar, penurunan emisi ya emisinya enggak signifikan pabrik plastik, pabrik petrokimia sebetulnya mereka kan tidak perlu emisi karena barang resources yang perlu dijaga mereka enggak boleh diemisikan. Nah, ada satu peluang untuk memperoleh nilai bagus dengan mem- mendeklarasikan produknya itu ramah lingkungan. dengan item-item uh, komponen-komponen dampak yang sudah didefinisikan di dalam life cycle assessment. Apa CO2-nya, berapa pemakaian energinya, nah itu bisa digunakan sebagai saya itu lebih baik dibanding dengan uh, produk dari yang lainnya. Nah, 
mungkin ini tidak ada hubungannya dengan LCA, tapi ini kaitannya dengan pembelajaran uh, COVID-19 ini. Kita melihat bahwa meskipun punya kegiatan yang berkurang, tapi ternyata konsen teman-teman di industri terhadap uh, responsif dan uh, kebencanaan, bantuan terhadap kebencanaan tinggi. Maka atas arahan Ibu Menteri ditambahkan kriteria kebencanaan ini di dalam kriteria proper. Nanti akan kita jelaskan. Terus kemudian dari puncak ini, jadi ada di eko-inovasi, jadi kita mendorong life cycle itu menggunakan das, eh, dasarnya, kemudian efisiensi energi punya tool-tool khusus yang akan menjawab itu akan muncul di eko-inovasi. Tetapi di seluruhan itu, ada yang di atasnya yang nanti akan menjadi screening untuk proper yang emas itu adalah inovasi sosial. Nah, boleh lanjut uh, di slide berikutnya. Nah, ini adalah yang tadi yang berkaitan kebencanaan, mohon maaf nggak ada hubungannya dengan LCA, tapi mungkin kita sampaikan biar teman-teman juga sudah mulai mengantisipasi. Jadi dasarnya adalah apakah teman-teman berkontribusi terhadap penanggulangan bencana. Awalnya sih idenya dari COVID-19. Tapi kita melihat dari tahun-tahun sebelumnya ternyata teman-teman di perusahaan itu juga punya kontribusi yang luar biasa terhadap penanganan kebencanaan. Maka hal-hal yang seperti itu mestinya juga didokumentasikan, dijadikan pembelajaran, dan juga diapresiasi maka kita memberikan apresiasi. Konteksnya adalah apakah terlibat dalam setiap upaya pencegahan, mitigasi, kesiapsiagaan, tanggap darurat, atau eh, penanggulangan. Ini bukan kesiapsiagaan yang terakhir, tapi penanggulangannya. Kalau terlibat, skalanya itu menjangkau eh, kabupaten atau sudah internasional. Nah, semakin tinggi uh, skalanya, semakin jangkauan spasialnya semakin luas, maka uh, amplifikasi nilainya juga akan semakin tinggi. Kemudian juga kemitraan yang dibangun untuk membantu kebencanaan tadi. Kalau kemitraannya itu jangkauannya juga semakin luas, pihak-pihak yang dikoordinasikan semakin banyak, tentu effort yang dilakukan juga luar biasa. Maka kita mengapresiasi kalau kemitraannya itu dilakukan antara masyarakat, pemerintah, bahkan bisa menggerakkan semua perusahaan dan kerjasama dengan lembaga internasional untuk bisa membantu penanganan bencana. Nah, ternyata kita juga belajar bahwa karakteristik bantuan bencana ini akan berbeda dengan konsep pemberdayaan masyarakat, community development, dan CSR yang keseluruhan. Kalau yang ini kan lebih darurat, lebih sifatnya charity, sifatnya jangka pendek. Maka kalau upaya-upaya ini bisa digunakan untuk memperbaiki program pemberdayaan masyarakat yang existing, maka dia juga akan mendapatkan apresiasi. Saya contohkan ada beberapa teman-teman di industri yang membantu uh, membuat masker uh, yang dibagikan kepada masyarakat. Tetapi karena binaannya juga banyak penjahit yang nganggur karena tidak ada pesanan, yang buat masker itu disuitkan ke mereka, di binaan mereka. Sehingga yang ini juga bisa tetap jalan, tidak nganggur, dapat penghasilan, tapi juga bisa memburukan sumbang sih pekerjaannya yang butuhkan. Nah, kalau pola-pola seperti ini terjadi, maka dia akan menjadi lebih bagus lagi. Dan tentu saja ini adalah skala dampaknya. Semakin besar orang yang meroleh manfaat dari bantuan bencana tersebut, maka dia juga akan mendapat nilai yang tinggi. Nah, ini yang kriteria yang akan kita lakukan di tahun 2020. Kalau yang LCA baru kita akan implementasikan di tahun 2021. Nah, lanjut. Nah, ini ada satu lagi kriteria yang mungkin sebetulnya ini nanti ada kaitannya juga dengan LCA dalam konteks apakah ada program pemberdayaan masyarakat yang menonjol sekali, 
yang itu mempunyai ciri uh, apa menjadi sosial inovasi inovasi sosial intinya sebetulnya inovasi sosial itu adalah bisa menyelesaikan masalah atau kebutuhan sosial yang ada di masyarakat tetapi harus dibuktikan cara yang dilakukannya itu berbeda dengan yang existing harus ada unsur novelty-nya, harus ada unsur originalitasnya, harus ada unsur keunikannya. Nah, tentu saja kalau namanya inovasi, itu tidak boleh berhenti di ide, tidak boleh berhenti di proposal, tidak boleh berhenti di prototype, tapi dia sudah menjadi praktek sehari-hari. Bahkan kalau itu dilaksanakan beberapa tahun, maka itu sudah ditanyakan, seberapa banyak replikasinya atau seberapa besar dia bisa membuat perubahan sistemik. Boleh lanjut. Nah, selain itu, selain dua persyaratan di atas, yang namanya inovasi sosial juga bisa harus menunjukkan efektivitas. Harus bisa menyelesaikan masalah dan bisa dibuktikan. Harus bisa menjawab kebutuhan sosial. Kemudian harus bisa meningkatkan kapasitas masyarakat yang dibantu. Nah, gimana caranya? Ternyata kita juga ketemu dengan algoritma atau tool yang lain yang akan kita gunakan di tahun 2021, yaitu Social Return on Investment. Caranya untuk mem uh, sebelum belum caranya kita untuk membuktikan efektivitas menjawab kebutuhan sosial dan meningkatkan kapasitas dijawab dengan melakukan stroy lanjut lanjut nah konsepnya adalah seperti ini kita mendefinisikan apa dulu uh, posisi perusahaan siapa yang menjadi target group berapa kontribusi mereka dan siapa yang melaksanakan diterjemahkan menjadi program. Dari program tersebut akan ketemu outputnya. Outputnya ini ada yang memang direncanakan sejak awal, ada juga yang tiba-tiba muncul sebagai dampak samping dari program tersebut. Dampaknya bisa bersifat negatif, dua-duanya bisa negatif, dua-duanya bisa positif atau negatif atau positif gitu. Semuanya harus dinyatakan. Kemudian juga harus ada hitungan yang namanya masyarakat, yang namanya rakyat, namanya sosial, itu kan bukan uh, kotak yang uh, uh, tertutup. Ada kontribusi dari pihak-pihak lain yang itu juga harus dihitung dan digunakan untuk pengurang. Sebetulnya yang dilakukan oleh teman-teman di perusahaan itu dikurangi dari kontribusi yang dari perusahaan atau dari pihak-pihak yang lain seberapa sih? Dampaknya, nah itu dikuantifikasi semuanya menjadi uang, kalau misalnya di akhirnya keputusannya, berapa dari setiap rupiah itu yang bisa menghasilkan sekian rupiah manfaat yang dirasakan langsung oleh uh, masyarakat. Semakin tinggi rasionya, semakin menunjukkan bahwa program itu uh, efektif, program itu bisa menjawab masalah sosial. Nah ini yang akan kita gunakan untuk menilai yang perusahaan emas itu di uh, 2012 boleh sebelumnya uh, yang uh, nah, gimana hubungannya dengan LCA jadi kami untuk menjawab mana sih yang sebetulnya matters dari perusahaan untuk inovasi sosial tadi salah satunya adalah dari hasil analisis uh, stakeholder di seluruh supply chain tadi, kalau misalnya yang pupuk katim tadi, yang itu di petani, maka kalau inovasi sosialnya di petani, maka kita apresiasi. Tapi kalau inovasi sosialnya misalnya di uh, profesi pedagang, gitu, ya itu sebetulnya nggak nggak menjawab dari LCA-nya tadi. Gitu. Maka itu tidak bisa di digunakan sebagai inovasi sosial itu cuma gimmick-gimmick yang sebetulnya dengan tool yang ada bisa dipoles menjadi menarik tapi sebetulnya nggak menjawab yang metersnya di perusahaan itu apa gitu nah kemudian juga ada persyaratan nanti inovasi sosial itu harus ada unsur core kompetensi yang dimiliki di industri itu ditularkan ke masyarakat kemudian juga 
harus ada upaya-upaya yang dia bisa menjawab uh, sensitivitas terhadap bencana. Nah itu tadi yang di, kami lakukan untuk tahun 2021. Jangan khawatir Bapak Ibu sekalian uh, asiasi masih ada waktu satu tahun untuk menyesuaikan. Tapi yang kebencanaan kan Bapak Ibu sekalian tinggal mengumpulkan data yang sudah dilakukan oleh Bapak Ibu sekalian. Nah, apa kaitannya antara hal ini dengan produk declaration lu? Nah, tadi bagi kami yang namanya menurut pendapat saya pribadi, yang namanya knowledge tadi kan masih banyak berkeliaran. Kemudian yang heuristik itu bangsanya Bu Jessica, bangsanya Pak Adi Wardoyo, bangsanya Pak apa Kiman teman-teman Ilkan, itu adalah levelnya yang tahu bagaimana menghubungkan pengetahuan-pengetahuan itu. Tapi yang mengimplementasikan, yang tahu keadaan sebenarnya, itu adalah teman-teman di perusahaan yang dalam hal ini diwakili oleh asosiasi. Sehingga pandangan kami dalam mengembangkan produk kategori rule, itu semuanya adalah nanti kembali kepada teman-teman di asosiasi dibantu oleh ahli-ahli yang juristik itu untuk mendefinisikan. Nah, kalau itu dilakukan, maka yang kita atur dengan Pak Adi Wardoyo di levelnya KLH adalah bagaimana mesinergikan antara ahli, antara asosiasi itu untuk mendefinisikan. Mungkin yang dari... Uh, yang dari praktek internasional kita petakan mana yang sebetulnya sudah bisa diimplementasikan di Indonesia mana yang sebetulnya masih kita belum sama dengan mereka belum samanya barangkali memang karakteristik kita beda atau mungkin tingkat kita untuk mengumpulkan data yang berbeda nah inilah yang kita jembatani dengan uh, uh, produk kategori rule yang versi Indonesia yang kita kembangkan nanti di, dengan uh, dibuat di permen-permennya yang berkaitan dengan ini. Barangkali begitu gambaran yang uh, bagaimana uh, LCA, Produk Kategori Rule ini, kaitannya dengan proper dan tentu saja semuanya ini ditujukan untuk bagian dari kita semua untuk perbaikan uh, lingkungan. Terima kasih sudah diberi kesempatan. Wassalamualaikum warahmatullahi wabarakatuh. Waalaikumsalam. Pak Sigit, terima kasih banyak, Pak. Nah, mungkin saya lanjutkan dari Pak Sigit. Um, uh, apa namanya? I will give a brief presentation ya tentang practical SE applications di Indonesia selama ini sehingga kita bisa lihat uh, tadi Pak Sigit sudah menjelaskan bagaimana knowledge yang scattered itu bisa disambung-sambungkan dan menjadi satu metodologi ya framework uh, uh, sehingga uh, nanti kita bisa lihat juga uh, dari practical SE application sebenarnya apa sih yang terjadi sehingga kemudian kita uh, memerlukan uh, produk kategori rules ini. Uh, jadi mungkin uh, bercerita sedikit nih mungkin Bapak Ibu many of you already know about the milestone in L uh, of LCA in Indonesia ya. In Indonesia before 2010 uh, there were limited research on LCA in Indonesia ya. LCA studies started to emerge uh, probably more and more in 2015 promoted by the socialization by the Center of Standardization of Environment and Forestry and also the first workshop of LCA research in Indonesia. Uh, it was uh, held by the Indonesian LCA network. Everybody here must, must already know, Ilkan, yeah, to, throughout 2015 to 2018, I was heavily involved in ILKAN to promote LCA applications, capacity building, networking in national and also international uh, settings. Yeah. In, in, in 2016, uh, ILKAN known to be one of the most growing LCA network according to the Life Cycle Initiative, UNEP Life Cycle Initiative. And then Indonesia started to, started to adopt 
the standards for LCA in 2016 and then 2017 and the demand for capacity building uh, and application of LCA started in to around 2018 and 19 yeah of course this is due to the support from the Ministry of Environment uh, through proper draft and then also inclusion of LCA in green ship rating tools yeah from uh, GBCE yeah, Green Building Council Indonesia um, in uh, and then LCA initiate uh, LCA applications in 2019 becoming even more and then there's also increasingly uh, awareness yeah increasing environmental awareness in society suddenly people start uh, don't want to use plastic plastic bag anymore yeah uh, don't want to use uh, plastic straws and and many many kinds of uh, initiative that uh, are growing in our society ya yeah? uh, bapak ibu pasti tahu juga and then uh, because of uh, of that initiated with those demands uh, EPD Southeast Asia uh, is established in 2020 so in Indonesia LCA has been started to be applied in many many applications ya yeah? but the reasons are there are a variety of reasons alasannya berbeda-beda so many uh, uh, reasons yeah uh, for example for policy development yeah market demand competitive advantage some companies want to export their products to Europe probably to Australia or to Japan and so and so on and so on so there is there is a competitive advantage market require uh, require these companies to do LCA uh, and then also uh, for waste management, uh, there are even more uh, analysis of, of waste management. How can we uh, address this waste management using LCA? Environmental regulation through proper, of course. Sustainability initiatives, companies has done. Uh, resource efficiency for process improvement. Also for green product development. And also uh, for projects targeting on carbon neutral. So uh, maybe bapak-bapak, uh, bapak ibu around uh, in this uh, webinar, uh, uh, you know who you are, who, and then what kind of uh, reasons that you are in here. Hopefully, I captured most of you. Yeah, and then uh, in this case, the use of LCA and EPD can be used throughout the supply chain and the value chain, whether it is for B two B or B two C. Uh, in the manufacturing of products, EPD can be used for raw materials procurement to choose the best material for the product and also to establish for, uh, for example, for green public procurement, for allow better planning, infrastructure development uh, for government or even for uh, private. Yeah, in micro microscopic scale, the information uh, from a company regarding products and practices also can be used for uh, financing, sustainable financing uh, purposes. That is uh, more and more uh, familiar for us uh, who are uh, encouraged uh, to do sustainable uh, products or for sustainable projects. The environmental information from EPD can be used to support consumer information for sustainable consumption and production, green public procurement, sustainable financing, and also green buildings and infrastructure. Now, however, in my experience as an LCA consultant and also uh, an, uh, uh, previously academic, uh, when we go to clients, we always receive this, these questions. Yeah, uh, that I'm sure some of you are asking as well. Yeah, for example, what kind of system boundary that I should use for my LCA study? Cradle to gate, cradle to grave, gate to grave. What is it? Yeah, what is cradle actually? What is considered as upstream process? What is the grave? What is considered as end of life? Yeah, uh, many many times these questions uh, come up. Which process that I should include in my LCA study? Should we include maintenance process? How many machines or materials that we should include in the system? How should we model the recycling process? How my products produces many co-products? How should we do the allocation? How about activities such as research and development, office operation, business travel? Should we include it or not? Yeah, and then. Uh, questions another questions like I don't have any data from my suppliers. Can I use the database? 
Is there any specific calculation rules that is relevant for my industry? For example, uh, emission of fertilizers usage, fugitive emissions from machines and equipments. We need to collect many data. So which data can we identify that should be site specific? Which data that can we use the database? Or sometimes there also question, I, uh, we only use this material every once in a while. Is this material, so we, should we include it in our LCA study as well? Yeah, and then uh, another question uh, uh, that uh, always come up, yeah, every time. Uh, what kind of impact assessment method should I choose? How many impact categories? Is the impact indicator that I use common to be used? Is that the common uh, denominator? Uh, the common equivalence, can my LCA be comparable to other companies? How is benchmarking done when we do LCA? So this kind of question, uh, I think some of you or most of you have this kind, uh, this kind of question. And uh, LCA in the ISO 14,040 and 45, uh, 44 provides a standard on the framework and methodology. Yeah? At the same time, it provides a lot of flexibility that requires us to document it. So uh, in the beginning, if you ask me, how do we uh, do LCA? Can we do this? Yes, you can. Can, do this? can you do this? Yes, you can, as long as you document it. So some of this flexibility yeah, needs to be close or to be determined. Yeah? Kita mesti kunci yang mana nih, yang masih terbuka. Gitu ya, opsi-opsinya. Kalau misalnya kita buka opsi tersebut, satu company melakukan gaya A, another company melakukan gaya B. Nanti pada saat kita mau compare, compare between the products, then we will be confused. Uh, and uh, this kind of things, that is the reason why we need product category rules. Yeah. Um, now, the next um, session with uh, Sebastian, Sebastian Stiller from EPD International who will give us some light on this topic. Yes, Sebastian. Uh, hopefully you can help us to uh, give us understanding how we should do this, how should we should approach it. Thank you. I uh, pass it over to you, Sebastian. Yes, thank you very much, Jessica. Um, first of all, thank you for having me in this uh, very interesting webinar uh, for all the great in introduction to the Indonesian situation. I'm not familiar with that. I'm welcoming you and sending my regards from Sweden. Not so warm Sweden. Uh, we have sunshine, but I guess we don't have the temperatures as you have in Indonesia. Um, at the same time, you already announced that I today will be replacing my colleague Gustav Sandin. Uh, who, as a matter of speaking, as of right now, is in hospital and with his wife. So uh, we wish all the luck to him, of course, that everything went goes uh, according plan, let's put it this way. Um, what I also would like to communicate is, uh, because of my title, I'm a business director, so I'm not uh, an environmental engineer. So whenever there is a very specific topic on information that I'm going to share with you on a, I would say, fairly high level uh, condensated way because I can't cover the whole piece of product development in one hour going into details. I'm very happy to receive your questions and I can take them with me if I can answer them today and I will ask my colleagues then to give you a, a very detailed uh, response to your questions. I hope that you then uh, will be satisfied with the response. Uh, what I also like to share, share this information that I'm going to share now today with you is actually also available on our website via environdeck.com in more detail and it gives you more pointers, I would say more practical pointers as well. Uh, and of course you can always contact our, uh, our uh, regional hub, uh, so EPD Southeast Asia with Jessica and David and if they can't support then of course we're in the background supporting our hub as well. So now I'm going to share my screen and I'm going to switch off my video to not confuse you or distract unnecessarily and I'm asking uh, you know can you see my screen Jessica yes great so this uh, this presentation 
is uh, now from coming from EPD International AB, which is the mother company to the international hubs that we're working with. And as we have in our, I would say our slogan, where we call ourselves the proud inventors of the PCR and EPD, because as you can see later from our presentation, this is the presentation structure that I'm now sharing with you. I would like to spend two, three minutes on who we are as international EPD system, what an EPD actually is, what it does and what it does not do, uh, what a PCR is in essence, and then how do we get to the, uh, actually having a PCR out there in the market. And I will talk about the uh, five steps uh, that are part of that life cycle uh, stages of a PCR. And I hope that there in the end there will be some room for Q and A's. So if we start with who we are, um, some of you may know us already because we have a couple of EPDs from the Asian uh, territory. Uh, some of you know us as the international EPD system. Some may know us as EPD International, as the, the owner of the system. And some know us as envidondeck.com, which is the website that uh, we share our information with, with you. But maybe to start from the beginning, international EPD system was the first worldwide first EPD program founded in 1997. And it was jointly owned by the Swedish Environmental Protection Agency, so the SIPA, and industry, because there was a need from industry to start working on communicating comparable and trusted information on the environmental impact of their products and services. For that, we work with the Type 3 EPD certification and registration of environmental product declarations. I will go into detail. Uh, it was mentioned already by uh, my colleagues and uh, Jessica as well that we followed Type 3. I give a short explanation there as well. But in essence, we will follow the ISO 14025 as well as the EN 15804. And the EN 54, just for your information, I would say it's it's called a, a mother PCR, which is a, a standard that has been uh, developed by the European Commission. That's why it's an EN, so a European uh, standard that is used for the construction sector only. EPD International AB, our, as I already mentioned, is the program operator and the owner of the International EPD system. And you can reach us again on the nvidium.com. So all the information that I'm sharing today, you can reach by clicking on that link and searching uh, and, uh, well, clicking your way through to our website. What I also would like to mention quickly is here in 2014, uh, the International EPD system was transferred and became subsidiary to the IVL, Swedish Environmental Research Institute, in short IVL. And it was registered as a private firm. So we are an independent company uh, managed by a foundation under the IVL. And I share some key indicators with you quickly. So the revenues of last year, here to say, were roughly 7 million Swedish crowns. And that equals roughly, I would say, 650 to 700,000 uh, US dollars. That's the revenues. We have currently, uh, in 2019, we had 1,300 EPDs from 45 countries, but as you saw already by Jessica, she had a number of 1,400, and I can now communicate that we already have over 1,500 EPDs. So despite Corona or COVID, uh, we see a very large interest, growing interest in actually having EPDs out in the market. Uh, we currently, and this is important for today, also have more than 100 PCRs already readily available in our library. So there's a good chance that when you're listening and you're interested in actually providing an EPD that we do not have to go through the steps that I'm going to explain to you later, but you already may find a PCR that is suitable for your product or service. Also very happy, and that's of course for me as my, in my role, very important, have a high customer retention rate. So we have a high satisfaction here of more than 98%. Well, I can say uh, as well, the, the majority of our EPDs are coming from the construction sector because uh, it's a very mature market, working a lot already with LCA or building LCAs. And we also here in Europe see a lot of mandatory requirements coming uh, where uh, manufacturers will be, uh, well, it will be compulsory for them to actually provide environmental data, uh, environmental performance data on their products. The top five countries for our EPDs, to surprise, maybe to you, is not Sweden, uh, because we're located in Sweden, but it's actually it's Italy, Sweden, Spain, Great Britain, and Turkey. And we have different kinds of products, as I already mentioned, because if more than 100 PCRs, where other program operators, as you may when you skim through the, webs, uh, the web, uh, are focusing solely on the construction sector. 
We as EPD, uh, EPD International are, I would say, a truly global international network. Uh, we have, uh, we're operating, as you can see in the top, um, uh, in the yellow uh, from, from Sweden. We have uh, an operational help desk for China, which we're operating ourselves. Otherwise, we're working with international partners. Uh, so we have a couple of hubs. So EPD Russia, EPD Turkey, EPD India. Uh, as hubs, for, as a, for example, but also now, of course, here EPD Southeast Asia, uh, which covers uh, a large, I would say, space already in the uh, Asian market with having uh, the, our marketing and sales activities delegated to, to the hub for Indonesia, the Philippines, Malaysia, Singapore, and Vietnam. We're also planning for additional hubs this year. So one of them will be Southeast uh, South Africa. And we are, I would say, coming to a closing and setting up uh, with EPD Egypt as well. Um, so from this picture uh, and the color coding, I can quickly explain as well that uh, yellow is what we are managing ourselves as EPD International, blue is hubs in preparation, green is the registered EPDs in countries without local representation. But of course, important for this meeting here, orange is our international hubs. As EPD International, as an organization and as a network, uh, I think uh, Jessica phrased it quite nicely as well, but we're here to help and support you as an organization or as an industry association to communicate the environmental performance of your products and goods and services in a credible and understandable way. So what does that mean? Because Jessica uh, stopped with asking you, you and ourselves, maybe rhetorically as well, a lot of questions about life cycle assessment. But at the same time, where we have criticism in the sense of there are too many numbers in LCA that you can work with, they're impossible to understand, who knows something about eutrophication, acidification, what does it actually do? Uh, you, what kind of results can you get out of it by actually setting, uh, taking your assumptions and setting the, the rules as you really can yourself, as we have learned from the ISO 1440 series? Uh, it potentially may not cover everything and are we possibly leaving out the critical uh, parts out of the LCA that we want to use for specific communication purposes. And of course, there are too many initiatives using LCA as a methodology. Before I will start coming into the PCR, I will quickly talk about what an EPD then is, because I think this is important. And here I can, uh, I'm, I'm sharing a, a picture, which is, may look quite complicated, but I'll guide you through quickly, because from the situation, at least in Europe and other parts, uh, and as I learned today in Indonesia as well, uh, I can say it's to a certain extent it's guessing for organizations, manufacturers, but we see that the possible implications of the increasing let's call it political activism for sustainability. Uh, for example, or especially also here in Europe by the European Commission's new Green Deal, uh, they will be comprehensive and they will be far reaching. Because the one thing is that we do know for sure is that the legislative or the regulators will push for mandatory requirements to lower the environmental footprint of products and services in the market. In Europe, there are actually concrete plans to penalize those whose offerings cannot meet the sustainability target targets that will be set out by the European Commission. In fact, uh, there are discussions going on and they're premature to make that very clear in this meeting here, uh, there is, that their future access to the European market may be at stake when we can trust the discussions on the DOP and CPR discussions, which are related to the CE marking, so the conformity, uh, conformity European stamp that most of you know when you're exporting products to the European Union. They were, they're looking into making it mandatory, the BVR7, uh, to actually include environmental impact information in the CE mark as well. So as a result, many organizations see themselves now confronted in, with a situation in which they need to act or react, uh, if you're uh, still not working with LCA, for example, to find solutions to meet those growing demands for uh, data uh, to either externally or internally communicate your performance. And this can be on your organization, on your value chain, but also on your products and services. And when we look at the products and services, particularly in a life cycle setting, so not only talking about the mining and extraction and the production stages, but also about what kind of a second life opportunities we have. 
And in response, we can see that a lot of the organizations that are committed themselves to sustainability initiatives, and I think the hottest ones globally right now are the Sustainable Development Goals, the SDGs, the circular, uh, Circularity or Circular Economy Initiative that's going around here with eco-design, et cetera. We have the science-based targets, but also, and this was mentioned previously earlier as well, carbon neutrality, because this is, uh, I think, an, uh, uh, a phrase that manufacturers and actually their customers uh, and their end users of the products do understand. Fortunately, we also see now that there are plenty of organizations who already developed, I would say, convincing roadmaps to adopting these life cycle based methods for their, their journeys to meet the moving target of becoming carbon neutral, as we have so nicely seen now with the proper regulation uh, in Indonesia. But, and this is something that we're going to talk about today, once organizations have started off, they quickly realize that having access to high quality objective data is an absolute necessity to communicate their undertaking convincingly. And for that, you need frameworks and regulations. So here, uh, I quickly drafted as well the different kinds of communication that you can have. So you have uh, the ISO 14024 for environmental labels, which is called the type one uh, labeling. Um, this is um, something like Max Havelaar or the Green Air, the Blue Angel, etc. We also have uh, the type two, which is the self-declared environmental claims. And they do typically not have to follow a life cycle uh, approach. And they got governed by the ISO 14,021. We also have a ISO, and this is, what, this is key to today's meeting. We have the environmental declarations, which is the type three, and they are follow the LCA impact, the LCA, LCA uh, procedures, uh, and are governed by the ISO 14,025. I think this is what I would like to share with this screen before I move on to the next one. What is then actually an EPD? So an EPD by definition communicates, communicates sorry, transparent, objective and comparable information about the life cycle environmental performance of products and services. So uh, an EPD follows the ISO 14025, as we have learned, and it's a declaration. And a declaration means that it's not a label or a claim, that is it Itself, the EPD itself shall not benchmark performance. So it, the document itself, the EPD cannot give you any information on product X is better than Y. It follows uh, its LCA, that is the foundation, follows the product category rules that we're going to talk about now in two minutes. Um, it will also uh, have to be independently verified. This is key. Uh, EPDs have to be registered. Uh, with an EPD program operator, otherwise you cannot call it an EPD, uh, at best an LCA study. An EPD uh, can be offered in various formats for different data quality levels. And what I mean with that is that an EPD can cover one product from one manufacturing site. It can cover also one product from many production sites from one company. It also can include several product variations in one single EPD. I'm going to have to, to my, another uh, a bullet on this one. And you can have a so-called sector EPD, which is representing a sector average. Uh, of course, here a note that uh, the quality rises, the more specific information gets. So the, I would say the highest valued EPD here is the one product from one manufacturing site. Of course, if that's possible, one product from many production sites. Uh, a note here that the one EPD, like I mentioned, can include product variations, so so-called grouping. But for example, as we can see in the construction products, PCR, there is a limitation that uh, you can only have a ten, less than 10% variance in your GBP greenhouse gas uh, indicator. Otherwise, you have to report it separately. So, But there's an opportunity to have uh, many, many, many uh, product variations in one single EPD. What do we communicate actually? What do we report in an EPD? Typically, and this is uh, the predefined set uh, that shall, shall be used by any PCR, is the global warming potential, acidification, eutrophication, formation of tropic ozone, so POPC, abiotic depletion uh, potential, abiotic depletion potential, and then the water scarcity potential. Uh, this is the, the predefined set, and we're going to learn later that uh, you can, of course, add as well, depending on the product category that you're looking at. There is also an opportunity in our system to actually have a so-called single issue EPD. 
which is currently uh, work, work in progress. We're now looking into full alignment with the ISO 14067, so the carbon footprint uh, ISO standard as well. So in the near future, there will be an annex or a full alignment within our GPI uh, to actually produce a CFP from an EPD, not the other way around. I don't think I have to stop here with applications because I think uh, Jessica already nicely form, uh, uh, made this very specific to in the Indonesian case, but we can see here in Europe also that is very much used for the eco-design directive that is uh, here under development and under revision. But otherwise, um, I will leave it to here to save time. So now we come to the key of this afternoon with you here. What is a PCR and how do we get there? So if we look at the PCR, uh, in our world, in the world of environmental declarations, a PCR is a product category rule. And it is a document that provides the rules, the requirements and the guidelines for developing an EPD for a specific product category rule. Uh, category, sorry, and here we use the UNCPC framework and we'll touch upon that later. It is used as a complement to our general program instructions, so our GPI, uh, in this case, of course, of EPD International, but there are other program operators out there as well who have their own GPI, uh, because that's an interpretation of the ISO standards. Here you can uh, find additional information on the calculation rules, on the building scenarios, and on the actual EPD contents. When you look at the hierarchy of the different standards and who builds on what, uh, I share this slide with you quickly where you can see that we at EPD International, we follow the ISO standards, the 9000, 14000 series for the management system. We follow the 1440, 4040 for the life cycle assessment. We follow the ISO 1425 for the environmental declarations. And then we have, let's call it a, a document that we control, uh, our general program instructions. Uh, and then we have, as I mentioned earlier, the EN 1584 and to a certain extent, the ISO 20,930 standards, which are not under our control. And they are necessary or they required to actually develop our product category rules, our PCRs. And we have different, I would say, frameworks in place. Uh, one particular one now for the construction sector, which I'm gonna share with you in a sec, is that we have, let's call it a mother or a basic product category rule, which is quite broad and generic and it is then complemented with so-called complementary CPCRs. And these complementary CPCRs uh, are dealing with very specific product categories. So where the product category for construction products is, as it says, covers the whole UNCPC coding for uh, construction products, whereas the complementary CPCR covers, for example, walls or um, windows or something else, some more specific give you additional guidance on top of the more basic model uh, PCR. So what does that mean? Uh, for example, when we look at our now newly updated construction products uh, PCR, which follows the, the latest EN 1504A2 uh, 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 EN norm, yeah, you're, you're going to be confronted with a situation when you look into document that uh, is there actually only the basic PCR available, or is there also already now available a complementary PCR for a product category, product category that you are interested in? If there is a CPCR, you can actually produce any kind of EPD that is actually included in this CPCR. And that means that you actually can look into cradle to grave, including module D as well uh, of this EN15 standard, which means additional uh, so like biogenic uh, discussions and this kind of stuff, which are covered in Model D. In essence, it means that you can use or shall use the functional unit, uh, which is here then, of course, to make us clear for those who are not uh, so familiar with LCA, is the quantified performance of a product system for use as a reference unit for the LCA work. So the functional unit comprises the function, the quantity and the duration and the quality of their, uh, for comparability's sake. The declared unit is something that you use if there is no specific CPCR available yet in our system. And that means that you uh, work with the declared unit and you can use any scope except cradle to grave and module D. I'm not going into detail here. You will find the information in the so-called PCR for construction products, but just to give you an example, 
how, uh, how we work. Again, quickly to give you the, the, the hierarchy here, uh, we're working with standards that we cannot control, uh, the management standards. Uh, but we have, like I said, the GPI and the PCR, which are under control of a program operator. So we control the GPI and the PCRs. And of course, they are ongoingly updated by us via the support of the program of the PCR uh, process. I'm quickly going to check if there's a Q&A uh, regarding. I can respond now. How to categorize products? Yes. So a couple of the questions that I see uh, in the chat box, I hope that I can answer by going into the de development process. Uh, otherwise, I will take them later. So when we talk about PCR development, we have five steps, uh, like I mentioned already, that we are going through, which are part of the life cycle of the PCR. And I think the very first step that you have to take into in code when you will start with the initiation phase, going from pre to preparation, consultation and approval and publication up to what's well, called updating or actually deregistration at the very latest step. Here, important is to find out if there is no valid or relevant PCR already available, because if so, you can save the effort that I'm going to share with you now. And that includes not only a PCR in our system, but out there basically globally. What I would like to share up front as well is that this whole process that I'm now going to describe is uh, or should, shall be led in an open and transparent and participatory process. So it's, it's, a, it's a quite an engagement, it's a stakeholder engagement process uh, where we want to have as many interested parties included for getting a, a good, robust PCR that is accepted by the market. It could be companies and organizations who are working in cooperation with other partners, it could be institutions, it could be LCA experts, EPD experts, but also single companies, organizations who have, for example, in-house competences or outside LCAL, EPD experts that they're working with who are interested actually in developing a PCR. All right, so when I'm now talking, uh, I will guide you through the five steps uh, and their sub-steps that we have here. So when we talk about initiation, we, in our system, we have six steps that you have to go through. And I will quickly, uh, read them out loud and then I will go into in more, a bit more detail. The first one is the definition of the product category. The second one is the, uh, the uh, consideration of available PCRs in the market. Uh, the number three is appointment of a so-called PCR moderator. Uh, the fourth is seeking cooperation with other parties uh, to take actually part in our PCR committee. Uh, number five is the planning of the PCR development itself, the process. And then sixth, is very important as well, the announcement of the initiation of the PCR work on our website, so that uh, interested parties are made aware of it, uh, those that you have missed out in an earlier step. So what does it mean if we now talk about the definition of the product category rule? Uh, here I can say that the defined product shall, and this as far as possible, be related to the function of the product. So it should consider the primary and secondary functions of this product or service, of course, they look into some kind of price elasticities as well in the market, but also uh, product categories used in similar or related systems. <clears throat> so this is an inside out and an outside in uh, exercise. The PCR itself shall be classified uh, according to the latest version of the UN Central Product Classification Scheme. And this, I can say, is uh, a cornerstone because for us it's very important that uh, the development of a PCR for a product category shall be done considering readily available PCR documents in the same product category and the appropriate market area as it is being advocated in the ISO 14025. So it's very good that we have this scheme, uh, this product classification scheme that we can actually rely on. Um, sometimes there are other relevant classification codes also that you have to take into consideration. All right. Um, yep, I think I've said everything I wanted to say to this slide. 
The second step that you have to take into account, as I mentioned, was considering available PCRs. So here, actually, we are offering you via our website and VDONDEC uh, a whole checklist of possible programs or, I would say, sources where you can check for available PCRs uh, available on the market. So here we have working with so-called PCR libraries and resources, and we link to PCR documents from, I would say, roughly 20 program operators. Um, this is, of course, then complemented with, uh, for example, work that's done on the European Commission's level or other important institutions that are so-called PCR developers. I think what's important here for us to mention is that the harmonization of the PCR documents is key. So that means, again, that appropriate information from other PCR documents shall be used or should or shall. It's a bit of a discussion here on what we say, but let's stay to should to the extent possible because PCRs may have some intellectual property right issues as well connected to them. Uh, when there is a document available, uh, so it already exists, it is also important to examine, examine the basic LCA approach that is the foundation to this PCR and to, you have to find out if the degree uh, of consistencies with the approach taken are align, alignable with the one in the EPD international system. But again, say that as a general rule here, uh, we can say that you shall, should use the appropriate information from other PCR documents to the extent possible, like we've said here. If a PCR does not exist for the property category of interest, this is to, has to be prepared and approved in accordance to the procedures of our system, to make that very clear. So we're giving you a lot of guidance, but it is a little bit of uh, searching for available information that you should have to take into consideration. Um, now, having said that, it's important, of course, that this is orchestrated. So it cannot be that anybody who is involved here in the process has to do the same task. So therefore, we appoint a so-called PCR moderator. And the PCR moderator is someone, like it says here on the slide, who shall be familiar with the EPD approach. He has to understand our steps in our system has to have a basic understanding of the LCA, but it is also recommended that he has, I would say, basic program manager skills. So that actually he man can manage a project, fairly complex project with stakeholder concentrations included as well. This person can be nominated by anybody. So it can be anybody who is uh, meeting these requirements, but he shall be appointed by us, so by the international EPD system. Uh, to make it very clear here now as well, when we're talking about this PCR development, uh, this is going via the EPD international system and not via EPD Southeast Asia. EPD Southeast Asia or other partners can initiate this. They can do the connecting, uh, the networking work, but the process itself is managed by us here from Sweden. And I guess it's super close to say that this particular person has, in the end, uh, the key responsibility uh, to take the role as a, as a leader in this whole process. So he's engaged in all the steps that uh, I'm going to share now with you as well. So especially when we look for cooperation with other partners to take part into the PCR committee. This PCR committee is a, uh, is, is a, a temporary uh, uh, established uh, organ that should support the PCR moderator for the PCR development uh, and it follows an open cooperative effort including uh, as many interested parties as possible. This is important for us because we want to ensure that there is a broad acceptance like already mentioned and there is a reproducibility of the calculation rules that we're going to discuss including members also represent the geographical scope of the PCR. There may be limitations to geographical, geographical scope as then it shall be mentioned in the PCR. Typical stakeholders are competitors to, so manufacturers and their comp competitors. It could be a trade and interest organization. It could be a public institution. It can be LCA or consultants, academia, research institutions, NGOs, CSOs, 
uh, but also, for example, as we've seen today, uh, initiatives that are run by uh, uh, what regulator, regulators or um, non-for-profits, like we've seen as a partner to this meeting as well today. Once you have set up your team and you have clarity on, on the PCR, that's a lot of stuff, you start planning the PCR development process. So here, important is a time plan that is prepared by the PCR moderator. Uh, which is important to actually communicate and work with a draft PCR, PCR that shall then be, oh, shall be available for an open consultation step. So the whole preparation work will be result into an open consultation. Um, if necessary, of course, there can be a revision of the time plan. If there is a, a lot of interaction, uh, a lot of questions, a lot of uh, collaboration in the, the committee and the open, open consultation as well. But uh, like I mentioned before we are there, we first have to announce the initiation of the PCR on in videondeck.com. Uh, this is the job of the PCR moderator and he will provide the contact information on our website with the help of EPD International. He shall make publicly available information about the upcoming PCR work uh, to avoid, uh, as mentioned, parallel work because we, don't, we want to avoid uh, two or three PCR committees working on similar or fairly similar products. So here we may be able to line uh, if, if we see that this is going on. And of course, we want to inform and engage interested parties. Um, the announcement of the work is not only uh, done via our website, but we also typically use our newsletter. We use social media channels, uh, industry forums, etc., etc., really to create the broadest. Uh, uh, reach. This is a, an excerpt of uh, you can see of what is currently being uh, done in our, uh, for example, on, on inviewdeck.com. So we see open consultation stages where the PCRs are no, uh, listed that are open that are accessible for open uh, for for comments, uh, as well as on the development, for example, or oh, I missed on this one. I thought I had another slide, sorry. So uh, on the development, uh, we have also being updated, but uh, I missed that slide, I'm sorry. So once we have covered all these six steps, we will move into the preparation phase. And the preparation phase covers in essence five steps. And those five steps are making use of the relevant PCR basic module, which I'm gonna share an example with you as a guideline. So you don't have to start from scratch. We give you a lot of guidance on developing the PCR uh, with a template. You have to specify the LCA based content of the PCR document. You have to identify the preset categories of parameters to be included in the EPD. You have to select the relevant additional environmental information that is mandatory as part of the PCR. And then, of course, there's a quality check. When I quickly run through them, uh, I can say here the use of relevant basic module uh, as a guideline. And I'm going to switch now quickly to a document that we have. So then you get the first glimpse of what that means. We have uh, several basic modules. And this module, and this is very important to understand, is a template. So by using this PCR basic module, for example, for metal ores, you cannot develop uh, an EPD on that one because this is not a PCR, it is just a template. And the template, as the presentation shows later, co contains common text for all PCR documents, for example, the introduction, explanation of the system, etc. It also includes common requirements for products of the product group. So in this case, the metal ores, which I have as an example, and then let's call it specific information. And the specific information uh, you have to uh, define or decide on what you want to have included or not. And that's on there something that's okay there. So if I quickly show you the table of contents of a typical PCR template, you can see again here, and it's maybe now too small, so you cannot see it. I have to maybe enlarge it a little bit. Uh, there is some general information 
and then in the in the in the this template that is then of course then integrated or simply uh, as guidance information will be then deleted for the final PCR on the general information of the system, the PCR review and the background information. So information about how the open consultation process, for example, was managed, uh, the reasoning for the development. So why do we did we develop this PCR? Also about the goals and the scopes of the life cycle inventory and life cycle impact assessment. So here you're going to talk about the functional or the declared unit, as we've seen. You're going to you talk about the system boundaries, about uh, the cutoff rules, allocation rules, etc., cetera, etc. Cetera. This is all provided to you as a template, but you have to take here then with the specific information and decisions on how to handle this. Uh, and last but least, of course, there's a content of the EPD uh, as well. So what has to be included, what languages, for example, have to be uh, considered, uh, how do you deal with images, uh, et cetera, et cetera, et cetera. So I think this is a great guideline, a support for PCR developers, uh, which providing you with, a, I would say, a ready to make PCR document. But uh, of course, it's not that simple. Back to the presentation. So I'm going to back into the presentation. I covered the points that are on the on the on the slide. And again, this is a template, so you you are free to use it. And you should follow it to make life easier as a PCM moderator during the whole process. But you have to take decisions, uh, like I said, on the specific information. And in the document, you will find it in italic. You can download these uh, these these basic modules. Uh, for free. Uh, there is a, an intellectual property right on it, so you have to log in and accept our terms and conditions before you can download it, but it's for free. So I, 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 I welcome you to download the documents to get, a, to get an understanding about the specific uh, in more detail. So when you are using this template, uh, I already mentioned it, uh, the second step uh, is specify the LCA-based content of the PCR document. So you have to define the functional unit or the declared unit. You have to define the system boundaries. You have to make a selection or a decision on the cutoff criteria, on allocation rules. You have to, stand, uh, have to decide on uh, what underlying data are gonna be used, what is specific, which generics can be used. Uh, you have to define um, maybe in addition to the generic set uh, additional performance parameters and then the database requirements and with that we mean so if you're going to use generic data are you going to limit yourself to a specific database for example ecoinvent or another kind of database for uh, reproducibility or not so that's up to you uh, that's how the, what the pcr then defines in the end Important here to understand again, uh, these discussions have to follow our GPI content, so it has to be complementary with our GPI. It is based on one or more LCAs. As a minimum, you need, I think, three or four LCAs uh, as a reference case for your products, that, uh, product category that you're looking into. And it all shall be aligned through the PCR coordinator for the certain product sectors. When you are looking into the uh, parameters as the, the second last bullet, uh, you have to of course select them. Uh, and depending on the product category that you're looking into, the uh, preset set that we have, as you have seen in the, one of the graphs earlier, when we talk about GVP, acidification, et cetera, you may have to include additional ones to actually have a good reflection of the impact of the products. Uh, so they may, include other data that are not derived from the LCA database as well calculations. So you have to include additional environmental data. And uh, you have the PCR, basic, the PCR basic module who gives you some guidance on the categories to use as well. This is done work that we have done uh, with you based upon our experience. But this is an important step as well. When you have gone through that, you have to select so-called relevant additional environmental information. And that means that uh, there may be data in the in an EPD that are not part of the LCA study. So it could be information about a company's or an organization's sustainability goals. It could like for all, but also for example about management systems or the certification programs that are being uh, make sense to a specific product. 
Um, you can also have information on uh, how to deal with uh, waste management options because uh, the end of life is not always included in, a, in an old PCR. We also see that we may have information on so-called social responsibility. We have a couple of PCRs where, for example, we look into animal health care. Uh, animal, uh, well, well, health care, whatever, sorry. Yep. Once you've done that, it's very important to go through the quality check uh, before you actually can go into the consultation stage. Uh, this is done by the Secretariat and our technical committee. They check uh, the final draft of the PCR. Uh, there may be some editorial changes which have to then be followed up on. And then uh, if there's any kind of improvements for quality as well. Yes, so once you've gone through this quality check with the support of uh, our system, you go into the consultations uh, phase. And the consultation phase as such includes well, let me lie. Four separate steps, which is the constitution of the product category stakeholder consultation group, the preparation for the open consultation procedure, invite and alert people to take part in the open consultation, and then collect the comments during the open consultation process. So, when you constitute the product category stakeholder consultation group, which is the first one, you have to identify the appropriate stakeholders as really identified as uh, shared in this presentation. You have to invite them to the PCR committee or not for the public consultation. And again, here involved stakeholders can be any interested party, the PCR committees of relevant product categories. So some are very similar or close to the product category that you're looking into. Relevant stakeholders within the industry, the PCR moderators, uh, and also other program operators, for example. When you prepare for the open consultation procedure, uh, open internet-based participatory process, it is. So you use a PCR forum, which is an online forum, and you have an additional, you can have additional public meetings or face-to-face uh, -face meetings and other webinars whenever possible or needed required. Um, the presentation of the public announcement of the open consultation is going via our website, nvidendeck.com. And here we recommend, of course, that is always close contact with the program operator and the PCR moderator required uh, before you actually start the open consultation. So that is a cl close alignment between the PCR moderator and us uh, from here in Sweden. When you send out an invite or you send out the alerts to make people aware and invite them to take part in the open consultation as a next step, uh, you have to think about the preparation of the PCR proposal that is to be discussed, of course. You have to think about the publication of the document on the website, which is, of course, key. Otherwise, there is no information that they can work with. You have to contact the relevant stakeholders and inform them about the up upcoming consultation. Uh, and this open consultation typically takes eight weeks. Uh, we also provide the PCR moderator with a template that he can use for receiving and managing the comments received. When you're collecting the comments, the PCR moderator is responsible for the guidance on how stakeholders in the open consultation process can work via the PCR forum. So he has a, here an informing character. Uh, he also collects the stakeholder comments and he is responsible for the responses for the answering of all the comments. Uh, here you see an excerpt of a so-called PCR forum where there is a question being asked and then there is uh, related to the different kinds of PCRs uh, and then it's up to the PCR moderator to keep an eye on that one and, and act accordingly. So when you have closed after eight weeks, typically the consultation process, you go through the approval and publication stage. Here, I quickly can say that the PCR moderator and the PCR committee uh, are responsible for looking into the final draft. So they send comments for the open consultation. They send uh, the further review to the technical committee, which is managed here in Sweden. There is a summary of comments received and proposed with virtual proposed changes to the document, which is then again published on the PCR forum. And then you have to prepare the report. So there is a description uh, that includes a description of the open consultation process. 
uh, and it invited and participant parties, so who was part of the whole process, and it includes the main comments and how they have been handled. So to have the extreme transparency here on how, to, how you managed or dealt with the comments received. Then this document goes into the PCR review. So our technical committee then will look uh, and check if the PCR development follows our GPI, uh, is compliant according to other kind of relevant standards, including the GPI, uh, how uh, the feedback by the PCR moderator was handled, uh, and if so, effectively or not. And then we come with a verdict. And the verdict is that it uh, can be fully accepted. Uh, and as such, there's no work going on. But there's also an acceptance with comments, I would say minor. And then need for further clarification and amendments, which would be then including major changes to the PCR document. Once uh, the PCR moderator has dealt with, uh, I would say, possibly editorial, minor and major changes, uh, it will be approved or not. We can, of course, always decide if that the PCR will be terminated because the PCR moderator was not following the rules or other kind of minimum requirements. It shall be published on our international EPD system together with some in associated information. And important here to mention is the scope, the CPC codes, the registration identity, the PCR moderator, and the members in the PCR committee. And the PCR moderator shall also announce the, the PCR committee and other stakeholders about the publication. Um, so this is a, a, a shared activity uh, led by the PCR moderator. And then this is how it actually may look like uh, once it is, has been published. You can actually look into our uh, uh, PCR library. So you can look for a PCR uh, and see if it's there. Uh, and how did it look then, for example, if we look into one PCR, this is a PCR for electricity, steam and hot water generation and distribution. Here you can see, like I just said, information that is mandatory. And you can see here some comments on the PCR, on the, the consultation process and the actual document. And if you go then down, you can see here the detailed information about the CPC code, for example, 1771, in this case for electricity, electric and energy as well as steam and hot water. You can see date of the publication, registration numbers, etc. So this is all, I would say, meta metadata that are important. Uh, and once you have done that, it's very important to have an agreement on the validity of the PCR document. So uh, we're working here at EPD International with predetermined periods of time, uh, typically three to five years of validity. And there is always, uh, a there may be necessity in the, in, 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 within this three or five years that there is a revision uh, because there needs to be an update or uh, we find other PCRs that uh, we can harmonize because we can actually uh, have more broader uh, PCRs, for example. That brings us to the updating stage and I'm going to go very quickly through this one because I'm running out of time. Uh, you have three options uh, in the updating stage. Uh, either you can actually uh, everybody, of course, in general, to make this very clear, can have can give provide comments to the PCR documents which are collected. And if we see that there's substantial or immediate changes needed, uh, it can be managed via technical committee to deal with this very quickly. So think about editorial changes or something like that. But um, we uh, there is an option here updating the PCR following the comments received. Again, this is a formalized. Uh, procedure that is managed and led by the PCR moderator, then he shall revise the process uh, before the start of the uh, look into um, yeah, some kind of a, um, um, he's going to actually in invite the PCR committee and everybody else. And this is a six time period, basically. Um, it is always uh, interesting to see if there is a need for open consultation and technical review, because it, this depends, of course, on the magnitude of the update that's necessary. If it's just editorial stuff or minors, we don't do not may not we may not have to actually open up for full consultation uh, again. But this is then, of course, in the in the I would say in a judgment of the PCR moderator as well, together with us. There's also an opportunity to prolong the period of the uh, validity of the PCR. 
Uh, here, the involvement of the tech, our technical committee uh, is important because now it, it, because it depends on the type of comments that we have received. And the secretariat and may either prolong the validity if, uh, without having a uh, full uh, process in place again when there is no comments, uh, major or important comments that we have received on, validity, uh, on the prolonging of, uh, of an EPD, uh, PCR. Sorry. There's always also the option to deregister a PCR, uh, either because it's replaced by an overlapping uh, PCR with an overlapping scope, like I mentioned just ago. Uh, it can be deregistered upon request um, by a company or by an in, in interested party or, or and other reasons, of course, as well. For example, when the EN 1584 standard uh, expired and was updated. Yes, um, I think these were the steps uh, that I wanted to share with you. And there's much more information on our website, of course. Um, I quickly look into now into the Q and A if you may allow. Uh, otherwise, um, oh well, there's a lot in Indonesian, I'm afraid. Uh, but um, before then, okay, maybe just do it this way. Before I will go into uh, answering the questions, I would like to also share information on uh, mutual recognition. Uh, there are different program operators, especially in Europe, who have so-called mutual recognitions or uh, MOUs. Uh, so that uh, we basically accept each other's PCRs or EPDs without having to go through uh, a, a really extensive uh, exercise here. The, ex the exercise itself is done within EPD International. So we look into uh, a lot of harmonization uh, possibilities with other global program operators. For example, in Germany, a big one is EBU, but also you can think about EPD Italy or others and EPD Norway. Uh, with the aim in the end to have dual registration of, a, of an EPD in, in several programs or triple registrations uh, because that of course would make life much easier for manufacturers for example from, from, from Indonesia in this case willing to have uh, an EPD uh, that is uh, well accepted uh, in different markets also in Europe. I can say that our format is a global format but there are program operators in Europe who have very specific formats for a specific request. For example, in France, there is a, a mandatory requirement uh, of also include health and safety issues or other uh, information, including making use of a French, uh, let's call it database for having uh, uh, territory specific uh, uh, LCI data. Yes, um, I think uh, I will stop sharing now and I will hand over to Jessica. And I don't know how we're going to manage yes. the Q&A. Thank you, Sebastian. I hope I was clear. Yes, uh, thank you, Sebastian, for your explanation. Um, uh, I, we will we have a short explanation about the, the use of PCR after this slightly for, uh, for Indonesian settings. Uh, and then we have a Q and A, uh, just a little bit uh, more, maybe like five minutes. I will, I will uh, share to uh, David first, yeah, Sebastian. Yes. Thank you, um, David. Um, are you? Hang on, let me share my screen. Okay. Uh, Pak David Adiwijaya from EPD Southeast Asia, maybe you can provide a brief explanation how we can later uh, use PCR in Indonesia especially. Uh, okay, next. Um, mm -hmm. Okay, terima kasih Bu Jessica. Berikutnya saya coba langsung aja. Jadi kita langkah awal yang konkret dan bisa segera kita lakukan untuk membuat LCA yang terverifikasi dan comparable itu bisa kemungkinan melalui tiga senario ya jadi kita nanti bisa membandingkan produk-produknya dengan kategori yang sama bisa dibandingkan nggak cuma di dalam negeri tapi juga di seluruh dunia jadi kalau misal PCR sudah ada kita bisa langsung gunakan dan nanti bisa langsung kita adopsi Bapak Ibu kalau misal PCR-nya itu ada tapi ada penggunaannya kurang cocok di aplikasi dengan aplikasi dengan kondisi di Indonesia karena Indonesia lebih ketat atau lebih longgar peraturannya, kita bisa memodifikasi PCR tersebut dan menambahkan di annex. 
kalau PCR-nya belum ada, kita bisa membuat PCR tersebut bersama-sama dengan pemegang kepentingan terkait. Contoh yang paling gampang yang produk-produk lokal kita kayak jamu ataupun batik. Ya. Um, kemudian saat ini kami dari PD Satisasia sedang memetakan PCR-PCR yang ada apa aja dan kiranya relevan bagi asosiasi-asosiasi industri. Dan PR kita bersama adalah untuk menganalisa apakah PCR-PCR terus yang ada itu cocok untuk produk-produk di Indonesia. Saya juga perlu sampaikan bahwa untuk penggunaan dan proses pembuatan PCR ini tidak dipungut biaya. Karena akhir-akhir ini saya sudah mulai terima pertanyaan terkait development PCR. Saya juga mau sharing ke Bapak Ibu bahwa saat ini saat yang exciting buat, karena lihat respon dari partisipan webinar ini ada lebih dari 250 orang. Hal ini merupakan rekor tersendiri bagi PD Internasional kalau belum pernah ada sampai sebanyak ini. Ini menunjukkan berapa semakin pentingnya environmental assessment buat kita semua. Jadi kami siap untuk bekerjasama dengan semua stakeholder terkait dan memfasilitasi diskusi untuk mapping PCR bersama-sama dengan asosiasi terkait, pemerintah, PPBN, dan other stakeholders. Oke. Okay. Next. Ini su- tadi sudah sempat dibahas oleh Sebastian. Jadi saya rasa karena kita sudah punya pertanyaan banyak tuh, kita langsung ke Q&A aja ya. Uh, 